The title of my message tonight is All My Days. All My Days. And uh, I was reading, I think it was in our uh, Daily Bread last week. Uh, it just caught my attention and caught my eye. And uh, I just thought uh, it would be an appropriate... I'm, I'm just you know, expanding on what we read last week in that. But... If you have your Bibles, uh, turn to Deuteronomy 6, and then go ahead and get Numbers 3 while you're at it. I just want to do one verse in Deuteronomy 6, or it's on the board, uh, Deuteronomy 6, uh, verses 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And uh, this is uh, what Jesus said in uh, the Gospels was the great commandment. And then, of course, we know the second one was to love your neighbor as yourself. So we as Christians need to always be reminded we need to love God with every bit of our being. Now turn to Numbers chapter 13. Our focal scripture will be Joshua 14 if you want to go there. But to understand Joshua 14... Uh, I'm going to go on a little journey today, and it, it's, not, it's not going to be like the format that I've been doing, uh, but I think you will get it. So look at uh, Numbers chapter 13. Numbers 13. We're going to start in verse 16. And a little background, we know uh, the spies are, are sent into Canaan. Uh, you know, we know that uh, God has already told them uh, that they, it is their land. And then what they did in the first part of verse thir or chapter 13 was they took a person, a man from each tribe, and they went out to spy the lands. And uh, two that I want to remind you of is Caleb and Joshua. Okay, Caleb and Joshua are, are the ones I want you to keep an eye on as we go through this. Verse 16 says, these are the names of the men whom Moses uh, sent out to spy the land. And Moses called uh, Joshua, the son of Nun, son of Nun uh, Joshua. And then Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, go up this way to the south and go up to the mountains and see what the land is like. Where they who dwell in there are strong or weak or few or many. Whether the land they dwell in is good or bad, whether the cities they inhabit are uh, like camps or strongholds. And again, this is a normal thing. When you are taking a land, when you are uh, going, going to war, because you know, they weren't just going to lay down and give them the land. Uh, it is good to send a party or to send, uh, in some ways, uh, spies in to find out what's going on. Whether the land is rich or poor, whether they're forced or not, be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. And, there was a, and the time was a season of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and spied out the land in the wilderness to Zin, as far as Rehob, uh, near the entrance of Hamath. And they went up through the south and came to Hebron, uh, Ayaman, and you can get, go through all those names. And now Hebron was built seven years before Zon in Egypt. And they came to the valley of Eshla, and there they cut down a branch with a cluster of graves, and they carried it between two of them on a pole. So the first thing they realized about this land, if you are carrying grapes on a pole, these babies are huge. Now, I like, I don't know if you like grapes. Matter of fact, uh, you know, being a diabetic, I can only have 13 grapes at a time. All right. I don't know why that's on the paper. I, I'm pretty sure it's because of the sugar. But I'm just telling you, if that was the case, I'd probably only get one grape. From it. They are so big. And they also brought some pomegranates and figs. And this place was called the Valley of Eshklo uh, because of the cluster which the men of Israel cut down there. And they returned from spying the land after 40 days. And that is a long time uh, to be in a foreign land. Now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran and at Kadesh. They brought back word to them to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told him, he said, 
uh, and said, we went to the land which you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, notice that word. Uh, a word we use nowadays is but. Okay, where's the but? Where's the but in this sentence? Okay, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there and the Amalekites dwelling in the land to the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of Jordan. So they're just saying everywhere we met, everywhere we went, uh, there is probably armies and fortified cities. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let's go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. So you're looking at two different things. When they were reporting these things, there had to be a gash in the crowd. Just one of those, you're, you know, <gasps> you got to be kidding me. But Caleb, I mean, he just said, listen, you know, basically God told us we can do this. Let's go up right now. But the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land, which they spied out, saying, The land is, thorough, uh, is through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And my question is, how would they know that? I mean, these 12 guys came in and out and was out there for 40 days and never engaged in anybody that we know of. But they are already, you know, in some ways, just say no or, or, you know, fear is gripped then. And by the way, folks, uh, fear is, is real in, in a lot of areas of our lives, okay? But you have to understand the Word of God. Uh, you know, when God tells us to do something, He's going to show us the way to do it, okay? He's going to give us the means that we need to do it. And what what I believe the children of Israel was thinking on, they were thinking, we are the ones, we are the ones, okay? And it's not about us, folks. It's about what God has told us to do, okay? And then it says, and all the people we saw in the air are men of great stature. They're giants. They're big boys, all right? And we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, uh, come from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their in their sight. Again, what do people with fear do? They exaggerate. All right, what is a giant compared to a grasshopper? I mean, all they got to do is turn around and smack them and step on them, and there was not that big a difference. And you know, fear uh, comes into our imagination. A uh, fear does a lot of things. To people, fear makes people uh, assume things, or, or you know, fear, you know, just sometimes it just paralyzes uh, people. Now look at verse four, chapter fourteen. So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And the children of in the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, "If only we had died in the land of Egypt." Do you see how, you know, the suggestions of some people will just put everybody into panic and everyone into fear? And folks, if God is on our side, we have nothing to fear. And notice how they voice this. God's chosen leader. They'd already seen in the Exodus they already seen Moses, uh, you know, talking to Pharaoh. They had seen miracles and seen all these things going on. In the first place that they go, that hey, you know, you may have to fight for this. They were basically blaming uh, Moses and Aaron. And and folks, you know, we we you know, when when God uses someone like Moses. I'm not saying, you know, we just, you know, bow to him and, you know, we put him on a pedestal or we do this or we do that. But, you know, uh, the, the complaining, you know, just there after what God has done. Uh, and, and folks, we see it all in life. Okay. If you are, let me put it this way. If you are in a leadership position, if you are ahead of something, you are going to get shot at. Okay. It's just going to happen. 
all right? And, you know, and here's what I found out. Okay, I've been at this almost 44 years, okay? You have to just buckle down. You have to put your head down. And if God has told you to do something, you can't listen to the noise, okay? You follow God, all right? And, and we're talking about a large congregation, large. We're talking some two million people. All right. And it says they were so serious about it. They said, we should, we should just say, we, we, we'd rather die in the wilderness than die in war. Or if only we'd died, why has the Lord brought us uh, to this land to fall by the sword that our, wi- that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let's select a leader and return to Egypt. What were they saying? Man, boot him out of there. God's chosen man. God prepared him. God, you know, took him to the backside of the desert, all right? And he prepared him. Even though they had seen the miracles that that he wasn't doing what they thought they ought to be doing, so it's time to fire him. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Genedith, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. What was that a sign of? It was a sign of mourning, of hurting, of of, this isn't right. What y'all are doing is not right. And they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel saying, the land we've passed through to spy out is exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us a land which flows with milk and honey. So what do we got? We've got 10 guys, and we, I mean, they're taking a vote right here, and the vote was 10 to 2. Let me tell you something about life, and I hope you know this. The majority is not always right, okay? Some people just speak the loudest. Some just people just speak with attitude, okay? God told them, this is your land. It's already you, yours. Get in there and take it over, and I'll be with you. But yet, this happened. The majority's not always right. Do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. (laughs) I like that. We're going to eat them alive. All right? I like that. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Okay, we went to let's fire uh, Moses and Aaron. Now let's, these two here, and throw Moses and Aaron in there too. Let's just stone them, and that way, you know, it'll, it'll be the majority rules. Okay, and folks, I'm just telling you, this is where we live in life. All right, folks, people will kill you for no reason today. I, I, I get where, when I'm riding or I'm in my truck, I don't cut anybody off. I don't look at anybody. And it's not a thing of fear. I just don't want, I mean, people are crazy. They will do things, you know, just, just, I don't know. Uh, It's just crazy how people are. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the meeting before all the children of Israel and God showed up in the place and he still did not do what God told them to do. Folks, I'm telling you, when God tells us to do something, we need to do it, all right? We don't need to listen to the noise and the talk. I call them talking heads. Folks, they're everywhere, all right? Now, look, back, look in verse 26. Verse 26. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? And again, just for sake of reading, you know, Moses and God had this conversation and, uh, you know, God basically said, you know, hey, uh, you know, you are right, Moses. You know, if you want me to take care of this, I will. And Moses was was pleading in the part of the children of Israel uh, for the children of Israel. I mean, the very people that, that wanted to fire him and oust him, all right, he was pleading for them. This con- con- conversation was going on. But yet God uh, was just trying to teach the people, folks, you have to understand when I tell you to do something, you need to do it. 
Okay? We, let me put it a different way. We don't need to rebel against the Word of God. We don't need to rebel against the will of God. Okay? We must do what God says. And I have heard complaints which the children of Israel make against me. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so will I do to you. And the carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness, all of you who were numbered according to your entire number from 20 years old and above. So what did God say? Okay, they were not listening to the voice of reasoning. God said, all these people that are complaining, all this generation, we are talking a generation of people. They're not going through the promised land. They're not, they're not going to get there. Okay, and we know uh, the rest of that story, how they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Now, verse 30, except for Caleb, the son of Genoeth, and Joshua, the son of Nun, you shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell in. But your little ones, whom, whom you said would be victims, I will bring in, and they shall know the land which you have despised. But as for you, your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness. Why did God spare the young ones? It's kind of like our food bank. Every once in a while, I'll hear somebody say, it's not often, but I'll hear somebody say, you know, we're just giving, you know, people, giving food away to people that they're going to every church in Fort Smith. Number one, we don't know that that's what's going on. Number two, it's not the children's fault. Folks, what did Jesus say about children? Let the children come to me. Okay? And I'll be switched. If I mean, you can fire me, and I, and I am not kidding about this. If we are not serious enough about taking, uh, you know, yeah, we're going to take some hits. I understand that. But it's not the children's fault. And I, I, I started this probably 19 years ago. And we started in a little room, just a little small room. And we started giving out food. Why? Because most of the time when somebody comes in, they either have their kids or they have their grandkids with them. And folks, I'm not turning away a hungry kid. I don't even know what it's like to be hungry. I have never truly been hungry. But it's not the kid's fault. And that's why I believe God said from 20 on down, all right, you, you, you're not making the decisions, okay? I'm not punishing you for what your parents have done. And, and of course, uh, they, they let, he let them live. Verse 33, and your sons shall be shepherds in the wilderness for 40 years and bear the brunt of your infidelity until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness. According to the number of the days which you spied the land, 40 days for each day uh, you shall bear your guilt one year, namely 40 years. And you shall know my rejection. I, the Lord, have spoken this. I will surely do to, so to all this evil congregation who is against me. In this wilderness they shall be consumed, and there they shall die. Now the, men who, uh, now, the men of, now the men whom Moses sent to spy the land who returned made all the congregation complain against him by bringing a bad report of the land. Those very men who brought the evil report about the land died by the plague before the Lord. The judgment of the Lord fell on those men. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Genoeth, remained alive of the men who spied out the land. And I know that's a lot of background, but it, I just think it's so important to understand Joshua chapter 14. Joshua chapter 14. Now look at verse 6. Then the children of Judah came to Joshua in Gilgad. And we know what's happening here in this place, in, in this scripture. They are dividing up the land. Okay, they're dividing up the land. And Caleb, the son of Genoa, and the Kenzite said to him, You know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. Folks, I'm telling you, Kadesh Barnea was a place, what I call a place of decision. Okay, they came to a place where they had to decide, 
What, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And obviously, they did the wrong thing. Folks, if you think about it, all of life is decision-making. And I will say this, nobody makes the right decision every time. We've all, I mean, I, I've, I've got some regrets in my, I got things if I had to do it over, I wouldn't do it that way. Okay? But you have to understand, and, and I'll get, I'll, I'll get I'm, I don't want to get this point away yet. I'll, I'll, I'll show you, when I'll, I'll tell you when I uh, get there. You know the word of the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you, me at Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought back the word to him as it was in my heart. In my heart. And I'm, folks, I'm all for democracy, okay? I mean, the, you know, there's not a better way. I mean, even the voting, you know, we're coming into the height of the election year, and I'm already thinking, man, I'll be glad when November, whatever it is, is over, all right? Because, you know, it's a thing of, of evil, man, evil, stealing elections, lying, um, making up stuff, all this stuff going on. But what, what Caleb was saying, he said, I voted my convictions, okay? God was in my heart, in my heart of hearts. I don't think I made the wrong decision, all right? And folks, there's many times, and I've, I've told people this, like people that surrender to the, sur surrender to the ministry, uh, even as, as a youth minister, uh, as I'd been there, uh, uh, you know, a long time, I got to start seeing young men surrender to the ministry. And I've always told them this, young man, follow your heart. What is your passion? What does God want you to do? You need to follow the Lord. And some of them came up against resistance. I know one, I know one dad and mom just says, you know, do anything but get into the ministry. And this, this young man in college was just, almost distraught over it. And I said, I'm not telling you to go against your parents. But I kept telling him, follow your heart. And do you, you know what? Let me just summarize the rest of the story. He became a youth minister later on, a very good youth minister. After he graduated from college, got out from under his parents, and he followed his heart. Verse 18, Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. Six times, six times in Scripture, Caleb says this word. Remember the first verse that we read before we got started? Thou shalt love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your heart. That's the same thing. It's just another version of that. I mean, he is literally saying, as God is my witness, I try to please God in every area of my life. So Moses swore on that day, and you have to realize, folks, Moses has already died. Okay, but I mean, he, he, he was, you know, a, a giant uh, in the people of Israel. Okay, if Caleb said this is what Moses said, I'm telling you that had a lot of clout to it. And obviously Joshua would have backed him up also. So Moses swore that day saying, surely the land where your foot is trodden shall be your inheritance and your children forever because you have wholly followed the Lord your God. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive as these 45 years ever since uh, the Lord's uh, spoke this word to Moses while Israel was wandering in the wilderness. Have you ever thought how, if you just look at it from a worldly point of view, uh, you know, a non-spiritual point of view, you would almost say, well, why did Caleb and Joshua, you know, why, why were they punished? Okay? And, and folks, you have to understand, there, there are going to be dry times in our seasons, uh, being in the ministry, working, uh, dealing with other people, there, there are going to be some times, you know, do we, we, we even say why? Why? All right? And, and you know, God was preparing them. And, and really what I feel like happened, 
Those two men were the leaders of those now older people, those, that 20 and under bunch. They were listening you know, to, Joshua, to Joshua and Caleb, and they were following them. So sometimes, folks, you know, uh, even when you start in the ministry, I'm just telling you, most people don't start in a church that runs, you know, 350 to 400 people. You know, you, you have to go to the little churches and prove yourself there. And, and, and folks, I, I think too many times we get caught up in this numbers game, okay? If you're out in the, you know, sticks out in a rural area in rural Arkansas, and you're running 50, and, and you think it's a den- you know, it's not a dense population, and you're being faithful to the Lord, I'm telling you, God is going to look at you the same as these guys in Dallas, Texas with these mega churches. You are taking care of the people that God said take care of. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive. And then he says, and now here this day, I'm 85 years old. And I love this. I love this. And yet, I'm as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me, just as my strength was then, now uh, my strength is for war. <laughs> you know what he was saying? The new 80, you know, the new 85, it's 40. <laughs> All right? And here's what we do sometimes think, and I'm, I, I fall into this trap sometimes myself, especially since I went through, you know, a year of just, I mean, folks, I'm just telling you, I was just near depression in all that. Near depression in, in, in some times. But sometimes we use our age as an excuse. He said, and, and you think about 30, uh, 30, 38 years in the desert and seven years in war. That's what Caleb and Joshua had been in. So they are basically saying, here we are, 85 years old, and I'm telling you, I'm not at the back of the line. I'm not in the war room. I'm out, and I'm fighting for the land which I get. I'm fighting for it just like everyone else. And it says, now, therefore, give me this mountain. <laughs> you know what we all, you know, a lot of us, you know what we, we settle for? Uh, you, know, <laughs> you know, give me that little cabin in glory. <laughs> And again, there's nothing wrong with cabins. And and again, there's no cabins in heaven. The word is mansions, okay? But we settle for less. And it's not a thing of ego. It's not a thing that, look look what I have. What do you think about mountains? Man, you've got to climb mountains, okay? You, You know, but the other thing I thought about when it was a mountain, we've been to a few places, cabins where up, you know, when, when we went on vacation and we were in the woods, okay, and we were on a cabin, we were in a cabin on the hill, just to look out and see the beauty of God's creation. I mean, it's a beautiful thing, folks. That's one, that's one of the things I love. When I, when I came from Lawton, it, if you've been to Lawton, it's flat. Other than the, the refuges out there, it is bare. I mean, tumbleweeds, dirt, and dust is out there. But Caleb is not settling for, he's just saying, you know, because of God, because God is my strength, give me the mountain. I'm, I'm not selling for hills. And he says, uh, for you heard in the day how Anakim were there and the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord says. He basically said, I I still don't care whether they were giants or not. Folks, if God says he's going to drive them out, he's going to drive them out. You think of all the wars that they fought. I mean, some of them them they fought, what did God do? He brought hailstones from heaven and hit every one of the enemy and didn't hit one of the Israelites. What is he saying? Folks, our God can do anything. And we settle. I really believe sometimes we settle for less because of fear. And Joshua blessed him and gave him Hebron uh, to Caleb, the son of Genoeth, and as an inheritance. And Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, uh, the son of Genoeth, and the Kizite to this day. Here the word is it again. 
because he uh, wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. Folks, I'm not saying if you do that wholly follow the Lord God of Israel that you're not going to have problems. I'm not, going to say, I'm not saying, you know, that there's not going to be maybe a city and you think and you remember when they come up to Ai, but, you know, that was all because there was sin in the camp. I'm not saying that you're, you know, there's not going to be rough times and, and times that you don't understand and maybe times you feel like, you know, things aren't going your way. But I'm telling you, folks, the key to finding the will of God is wholly following the Lord. God of Israel. And folks, I, I pray to the Lord that no matter what situation that we are in, that we will wholly follow the Lord God of Israel. In the name of Hebron, formerly uh, Kerjath Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim, and then the land rested from war. And we know Hebron also uh, was a place where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob lived. Folks, that's where the nation of Israel began. Okay? And so we see how it came a full circle about what God did. I know you know this verse, but folks, it is so important. Uh, Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40. And I, I'm, I'm thinking Joshua and Caleb was really having to deal with this as they were 38 years with these folks, you know, that were in the wilderness and was complaining. Have you not known, Isaiah 40, verse 28, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak. Folks, I am telling you, when you think you cannot go on, God will give you the strength to go on. Folks, we serve a supernatural God. We have the Holy Spirit inside of us. I do not like to hear Christians say, I can't, and then you fill, you fill in the blank. I can't. Folks, my Bible says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He gives power to the weak, and those who have no might, he increases in strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. All right? Folks, we are to be examples to the younger crowd. We need to be on the front line. We need to share wisdom with the young bucks. We need to be teaching young bucks. We need to be discipling or mentoring the young men and the young ladies that are coming uh, behind us. And the young men shall utterly fall. And one thing about waiting, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Folks, I've been on the mission field before, and I'm telling you, when you get to an end of the week, when it's 116 degrees and you're sleeping on a blanket on a tile floor, you know, with just, with the, with just a pallet, you know, you, you just think, oh, you know, we, we can do this. You know, you're even praying at night. And then when you get up and spend, you know, six more hours grouting, you know, before we had to leave. I mean, we were grouting up to the time we loaded the vans up. And when you look back and you're in Juarez, Mexico, and the church that you built, the only evangelical church on the west side, on a trash dump, okay, and saw what God allowed us to do, I mean, you, you, just, you just feel like, God, you are awesome. When you wanted to quit, you didn't quit. When you wanted to complain, you didn't complain. See, waiting shows a trust in God. And us, really, us senior saints, folks, to me, we, we have the most wisdom of folks in this church. We really do. And, and I, I truly believe there's no such thing. Just like me, you know, I mentioned retiring, but folks, I'm, I'm never going to retire. 
But we don't retire from the Lord's work. We really don't. I was thinking about this this morning uh, when I was going over this lesson again, and I had to think of Herschel and Linda Rye. I called Linda, and they cooked three years in Fort Worth on our mission trip for Scott. They were in their late 70s when they went down and did that. And I want to just quote what, what Linda told me today. She said, regardless of how old we are, if we could physically do it, we would be going with him again this year. So folks, just realize, I mean, here's Caleb and Joshua who are the elder statesmen. And they were still leading the children of Israel at age 85. And so, you know, just, just take that as, man, God's never going to be through with me. There's always something. Because even sometimes, uh, you know, I'll have a shut-in or somebody that's in a nursing home, and they get so discouraged just seeing the four walls, and some of them can't even get out of bed. And occasionally one will just say, I don't know why God leaves me here. There is nothing I can do for him. And I always say this, oh, yes, there is. You can pray for your church. You can pray for your preacher. You can pray that we as a congregation will wholly follow the Lord our God. Father, thank you for the day. And God, I just thank you for this example in the Bible. Lord, when I read it last week, it just stirred my soul. And God, I know 65 really isn't old. And God, I pray when I get to 85, I will still be going strong. God, I just thank you for, Lord, all of our senior adults. And I thank you for those who are really involved in ministry. And God, I just, I just know that uh, they have so much to offer. God, so much wisdom, so much experience. Uh, seen so many things, and raised uh, really two generations of family. So God, I pray this would encourage all of us senior adults that God has never finished with us. There's always more we can do for the kingdom of God. So God, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you for your holy word and examples like Joshua and Caleb. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.